There's been a lot of talk about wallet fatigue in Magic the Gathering, but is it wallet fatigue or has Wizards just changed the game? Well, what is up everyone? Welcome back to Kitchen Table TCG. My name is Louie. Hope you're having yourself a fantastic day. Thank you so much for finding this video, whether it's on Sunday morning or whenever you are finding it. Thank you so much for being here. Today, I wanna to talk about some massive changes to the way that Magic the Gathering is perceived. And uh, I think a lot of people are confusing it for wallet fatigue. I think even wizards might be confusing it for wallet fatigue. Uh, but Magic the Gathering used to be the same for all of us. For every person who is involved in the game, Magic the Gathering was a relatively the same uh, experience. You had one box with no extra special versions, right? You had one box, a draft box that came out, and maybe if you got lucky, you got the foil version of the card and you got to show that off, but it was pretty much the same box for everyone and, and no special versions. Uh, players played more standard formats uh, that we they had smaller card pools, so everyone's decks kind of felt the same and you know they kind of played you know in the same way uh, and sets released in three or four month increments uh, and you had time to really enjoy those sets you had time to really uh, take it in to draft it to place and sealed to build your standard deck with it you had time to really enjoy the sets as they came out uh, but things changed right today in my opinion Wizards of the Coast wants each player's Magic the Gathering experience to be unique. Before, everyone's experience was the same. Today, I think Wizards of the Coast intentionally wants each and every Magic the Gathering player's experience to be unique. Uh, and this transition over the last couple of years uh, creates wallet fatigue because we still look at Magic the Gathering as, no, I have to have what everybody else has. I have to go in with everybody else and I have to have this, that, and the other thing. I have to have the new set, I have to have this. But what Wizards is trying to do is get us to all look at Magic as a unique experience for ourselves. Um, and that brings adjustments for you, it brings adjustments for collectors, and it brings adjustments for players, it brings adjustments, really it's gotta bring adjustments for how Wizards of the Coast does things, and it brings in, in adjustments for the collectors and investors. So uh, we're gonna talk about all those things in this video. Um, so what does that mean? So first off, the differences. Now we have a million boxes, we've talked about this on the channel a couple of times. We have draft boxes, set boxes, collector boxes, you don't even really know which one you wanna open, uh, because they then put different things in each of the boxes for each of the sets. Um, you have uh, players who primarily now are playing Commander, uh, which is a format that has all the cards from all the sets, um, and it, everyone's experience is different. You, you just don't know what you're going to play against unless you have a pod that kind of plays the same uh, decks all the time. Uh, it's a large card pool. Everyone's decks are very different. And now they have sets releasing seemingly every month. I mean, it's unbelievable. You have something released, you have 48 secret layers this year, you have sets releasing, and, and uh, you have spoiler season going on now for a set that comes out in two sets. It's just absolutely crazy. It's just non-stop new releases, and you don't have the time to really dive in and enjoy the sets. Um, so what does this mean for you as a player as just a, an average consumer of this game, in my opinion. Well, I think you have to now, if you want to play Magic the Gathering, if you want to be involved in the hobby, you have to pick and choose. And for those of you who have been here for five, six, seven, eight years, that's really hard. That's a really hard thing for me. It's really hard to be like, no, I'm not gonna buy the secret layer. No, I'm not gonna buy into this new set. It's really hard because we were trained to just this is what we have to do. It's Magic the Gathering. We have to play it. We love it. We want to do it. So this is the only thing to do. But what you need to do now is pick and choose what you're involved in. Pick and choose the sets that you like and only invest and only play and only spend your time in those sets and maybe pick up a single or whatever uh, from another, you know, if you need it for your deck or something. But then you can't be upset with what other people choose to you know, to pick. So if you don't like Warhammer, 
If you're like, no, I do not want to play a Warhammer 40k deck in Commander, I do not want that, that's ridiculous, you can't be upset if somebody else says, no, I'm super excited, I'm stoked. I, I know so many people who play Warhammer 40k who have gotten involved in Magic. I get this message all the time. People leave the comment section all the time. People who um, never played Magic, but played Warhammer, picked up a Warhammer 40k deck, and now play Magic. Like, that's awesome. And you can't just be upset about that because Otherwise, you might as well leave the game, honestly, and I don't want you to do that because I want you to keep watching my videos, but this is the direction and it's honestly not worth being upset about. The Warhammer 40k decks are fun to play. They're fun to play against. They're balanced in the, e they're, they're relatively balanced even in pre-con ecosystem. So um, you can't be upset if other people pick the things that you don't pick. You should just be happy for them that they're enjoying something else that maybe you didn't find joy in. But then you have to not FOMO because sometimes you will pick something that doesn't work, that you don't like, and it will skyrocket and it'll be super expensive. And in the past, you would have bought in everything, but now you just have to say, it's okay. I don't like that. It doesn't bring me joy. So I'm not going to hop into it. I'm not going to be, so I'm not going to FOMO into those things. So as a, as a person, you have to pick and choose, and then you can't criticize other people's choices and you can't FOMO that you miss out on based on your choices. As an LGS, this is a, a huge transition too, and I'm working through this uh, myself, and then I, I've got to find a way to transition that to my team and, and whatever, but as an LGS, um, I think moving forward in this new world where Wizards wants everything to be a unique experience, um, you have to create unique environments uh, and unique communities really is the word I wanted to use there. You have to create unique communities um, because your communities are all going to want different things. It's no longer just, hey, all the Magic players at the LGS uh, want to hop in and, and do this format or whatever. You have to create unique communities and those communities need champions. You need to have somebody who's you know not on staff or whatever, or maybe they are on staff or whatever, but uh, somebody who is loves Commander and wants to really push that community to uh, to the next level. You have to have somebody who really, you know, if you're going to do standard, you have to have a community member that really wants to encourage and help support and champion uh, the standard format at your shop or whether it be Pioneer or whatever. Um, and, and this is an important, important thing because no longer are, um, you know, Friday Night Magic's people just coming out because it's gonna guarantee be the format that they want. Uh, people have to look for the format that they want at the location that they want. And so creating this dynamic of even not just Friday Night Magics, but different evenings, different nights for people to play the format that they want, you have to support different communities if you wanna be successful as an LGS. Um, and you have to now not overcommit. It's really important now to not overcommit on boxes, on whatever the new product is, uh, because the, the player base that is purchasing product direct in box form is so much smaller because there's so many different boxes. This is extreme wall fatigue. But if you look at it like, okay, I'm not gonna sell 25 boxes of this set. I'm gonna sell 12 boxes of this set and 12 boxes of that set. You're still selling the same number of boxes over the same amount of time. Uh, you just have to reduce your spend on that one specific box. And we're gonna get into Wizards of the Coast problem here in a second. Uh, but I think as an LGS, you have to start looking at it in those three to four month windows and say, okay, in three to four months, I can sell X number of boxes rather than just looking at the set and being like, oh, I'll be able to sell X number of boxes per set. So, all right, investors. I know we're just kind of all over the place in this video. I hope, I don't know, let me know if you're enjoying this format. Um, I just think this is a big shift and everyone's putting this on wallet fatigue and wallet fatigue is real. We're gonna talk about that when, the, when we get to Wizard of the Coast, but I think wallet fatigue is real, but it doesn't mean that like the game's gonna die. It means that the game's gonna change. And so I really think it's intentional for Wizard of the Coast here. They want everyone's experience to be unique. So investors, unique chances to, spe to target specific niches. Um, you're gonna have all these like Warhammer 40K decks. Listen, they're not gonna keep the Warhammer 40K decks in stock forever. I mean, I think we're gonna see a reprint. Rumor is um, that this past restock last weekend was 10% of what distribution order is entering. The, the rumor is we're not gonna see more until 2022. We will see more, but they won't be until 2022. 
Um, this is a unique position for collectors or for investors because how long will they continue to reprint Warhammer 40K decks? Eventually they will say, hey, these four decks are not gonna be reprinted. And it, it seems like at some point forever, People are always going to be like, oh man, Warhammer, I love Warhammer. Oh, they had a magic deck that came out three years. I wanna go pick that up. So I think it's it's created these new uh, niches that are really great for uh, investors and collectors and for people to, to know, yeah, they will probably reprint these again, but they're not gonna be able to keep this reprinted and the demand is increased as opposed to like, a, um, a what I don't have them back here anymore, but a Commander 2017 deck. Um, there's not that like direct demand. It's still just a Magic Commander precon. They come out with more Magic Commander precons often. If they don't come out with more Warhammer precons at a regular schedule, uh, then those Warhammer precons are going to be a, a niche that really perform really well for the investors. Um, but the contrast to that is that short term, I think you're gonna have more losses as an investor. You're gonna have more products coming out. Everyone's got the wallet fatigue. Wizards is still you know, producing a lot of boxes. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, and until they figure out that, you're gonna have short term losses for a while. And this is where we start seeing these Amazon sales. And like, dang it, I spent $175 on a collector box and then Wizards goes and puts them up for $85. There's gonna be a lot of that over the next couple, uh, I think over the next two years. Um, this is where dollar cast averaging is really going to take effect and uh, where you really need to not overcommit yourself uh, because the climate's just different. It, it's no longer, the climate's just, it, it's no longer like, hey, you buy a draft booster box and in three years it's going to be worth more money. Um, we just don't know what this looks like for wizards and what they are doing behind the scenes with the print. So, but long term, because nobody knows what to do with the draft boxes, the set boxes, the collector boxes. We don't have 20 years of time to figure out do collector boxes perform better than draft boxes um, or do set boxes perform better than collector boxes. We don't have 20 years of time to figure that out. So long term, uh, there's gonna be some huge winners in this. There's gonna be some people who pick things and win really big. And then there's gonna be some people who um, just kind of average it all out and win pretty small. Small. So, all right, let's get to Wizards of the Coast. I don't love doing videos that are like, hey, here's what Wizards of the Coast should do. They've been around for 30 years. I don't agree with a lot of the things they do, um, but whatever. Now I wanna get into that though. Uh, I think that Wizards has forgotten the 80-20 rule. If you're not familiar with the 80-20 rule, essentially, I'm boiling it down to 80% uh, of the money is spent by 20% of the people. Uh, and recently, Mark Rosewater in an interviewer on his blog and talk thing, he mentioned like 75% of Magic players don't know what a Planeswalker is. And 75% of Magic players don't know what, um, don't know who Mark Rosewater is. 75% of Magic players don't frequent Magic the Gathering content on YouTube. 75% of players don't um, know what a standard format is. And I don't want to get into the schematics of that statement. Obviously, the Planeswalker thing has brought up a lot of con controversy in the community. A lot of people say that he was saying that 75% of people don't know that you as a player are a Planeswalker. I don't know. Anyway, my point here and his point here was that the average magic consumer is not entrenched. The, the you know, this is the, um, the 80% of the player base, the 75% in his number, uh, aren't spending 85, 75% of the money, aren't in, involved 75%. Uh, this is the 80-20 the, the rule. The money is spent by 20% of the people. Um, and this is where things, I think, I hope I did a good enough job explaining that. But the 25%, in my case, 20, 80-20 rule, the 20% is so important because they're gonna be the ones that spend 80% of the money. So his point was basically, like, we don't care about the 25% of the people, but my point is that that 25% that of the people could not be more important. And if Wizards doesn't really reduce their print numbers, if they don't really hammer off and cut off their print numbers and their supply issues, you're gonna see this wallet fatigue kick in where they have this abundance of supply because their average consumer cannot even come close to consuming all these products. Whereas you and I think, you know, if you're watching content, you're in that 20%. Uh, you and I think, man, I've got to have this, man, I've got to have this, man, I've got to have this. And so we spend more money. So I think Wizards needs to really start controlling their print runs. Um, I, I think like the, the Warhammer decks, frankly, are really good 
uh, model for that. And if they move that way, I think really cool things can happen because everybody who ha everybody had the chance to pre-order a Warhammer deck. Wall of Fatigue exists, but it exists for a deeper reason. Wizards has changed the name of the game. They have changed the way that they want us to view the game. They want it to be a unique experience that you get to curate for yourself. And they want to allow everybody to have their own experience within their game. And, and that matters for everybody. So I uh, hope you guys enjoy the video. Hope you have yourself a fantastic day. Remember to be kind to the people around you and let me know what you think about that take in the comment section below.